the first weapon of war was almost certainly a rock. Some early version of a hominid picked one up and threw it at another hominid. Over the course of history, humans have evolved, but so have the weapons they used to kill each other. The rock became an arrow, which became a bullet, which became a cannon, which became a machine gun, and ultimately an atomic weapon. Historically, the trend has been big machines to fight the enemy's big machines. In World War I, we used airplanes to fight armies. In World War II, we used bombs to blow up entire cities. For 50 years, the targets were armies, navies, bunkers, silos. The U.S. has always been the strongest, in large part because it had some of the strongest technology. But today, the U.S. is fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan against insurgencies that don't have headquarters and command posts. America's big technologies of the past don't work to fight the wars of today. So, in the last few years, we've come up with a new approach. Robotics, designed to seek and target individual people. We've gone from big to small, trading mass for microchips. In this Vanguard episode, I go across the country to some likely and unlikely incubators of military technology to get a glimpse of how these small machines are changing war. Turn right, then turn right. I, I got an iPhone, you got a map, you got the stupid GPS. I have all this technology and, and none of it can locate where I'm going, which is making me really dubious about this whole idea of new technology and warfare because it can't even get me to Piney Flats. My search for the latest in military technology begins in rural Tennessee. Piney Flats sits at the base of the Appalachian Mountains. Here it kind of looks like there's just as many churches as people. You wouldn't think it, but hidden in these hills, robotic weapons of the future are being born. So we're gonna go visit Jerry Baber. And in the boutique arms making world, Jerry Baber is like a messiah. He builds guns, really high specialty guns. It's here in this log cabin at the end of a country road that Jerry makes unique weapons that no one else in the world can make. This is the laboratory? No, it's manufacturing. We make parts for guns, for the gun industry, but then we make our own too. How many people do you have working here, Jerry? We've got uh, five, 2,000 plus parts a week. He doesn't have many people, but we're productive. <laughs> Jerry makes all kinds of guns, and he's been involved in the handcrafting of over a half million components for firearms over the course of his lifetime. We built most of the machine guns that have been built in the United States of Parks for him. But what he's famous for is the AA-12, a fully automatic, recoilless shotgun. The AA-12 starts off as a piece of wax. There's 27 internal parts in the gun, and they're all made in wax initially, and then we're going to convert those to steel. The whole process of making an AA-12 is a complex amalgam of wax, steel, and heat, plus over a million dollars of Jerry's own money invested in this one-of-a-kind weapon. And they come out looking like this. Come on, let me let you shoot one round through this thing. It was time to shoot a very rare specimen in the gun world, a fully automatic shotgun. Just put one foot in front of the other so you're bracing, lean into it, and then turn it on. There you go. Now put it all out. That's incredible. Normally, when you fire a shotgun like this, I mean, you have to, you have to lean into it and you have to like, almost slam your shoulder forward in order to stop the recall. I mean, if anybody's ever fired a, a shotgun, especially with like a slug rounding or something, kicks, on, kicks like a mule. I mean, this thing, it's like holding a pellet gun. Wow. That was about 7,000 projectiles, oh probably. My God. Look here on the back side. I, I, I blew the plywood all off the back. You know, and that's wood. Imagine if it was flesh. The genius of the AA-12 is that it doesn't throw itself back into you, meaning you can hold it on to target for a long time. Woo! Up down! <laughs> the AA-12 was impressive, but... Having had a lot of experience with guns, 
the true test of how it works was to see how someone who had never fired a gun before handled it. Luckily, my producer was a willing participant. I'm so nervous. Lauren shooting the AA-12 is like driving a Ferrari for your first car. Okay, we're just going to shoot one, okay? Just click. I'm going to hold it right here, okay? So it can't come back, okay? Shoot one. You didn't feel anything, oh, right? God, it's up. You just killed that uh -huh. tree. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm fine. Anything, right? I'm fine. All right, just pull the trigger back and then hold it and let it run wide open. Go ahead. Despite her initial attack on Tennessee shrubbery, Lauren got the hang of the AA-12 pretty quick. And, dare I say, even liked it a bit. But for the wars we're in today, it's not about how I can shoot the AA-12. It's about how robots can shoot the AA-12. Last year, Jerry got a call from defense entrepreneurs in the Silicon Valley. They approached him about weaponizing some of their robotic technology. He's kind of cute, this one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they're, they're cute until they go off. Because of the recoilless nature of the AA-12, Jerry and the robot developers figured out a way to mount the shotgun to various land and air robots, making for a deadly combination. My job is to make them lethal and nasty, and that's what I like doing, so... They're nasty, but they're also small, an advantage in today's wars. Okay, let's say you want to breach a door lock, okay? We just drive over there to the door lock. Now, we're down the street someplace looking through the, through the telephoto lens or through the camera, okay? We line it up on that door lock and use a shotgun blast to blow the door lock out of it. I think in door breaching alone that they'll save countless lives. The scariest thing in the world that I'm told by people who've been there is to walk up the door and breach it and walk in that building. Because you never know what's on the other side of that door. It could be explosives, it could be a rocket propelled grenade, it could be light arms fire, anything you're facing. This is the ultimate application of Jerry's weapon. Fully roboticized and independently controlled. These things have the potential to be deadly, but Jerry has a special soft spot for them. They're almost like people, but they're not quite, but you know, they're, they're not human, but they do a lot of things that are human. Yeah. However, I've never been shot with one yet. And on that note, it was time to give the robot a spin. Come on, little guy, we're going outside. If you never get to shoot very much. Hunting Arabs, right? Where's me and Arab? Oh, there's one up in that wind up there, right? Okay, ready? Here we go. What do you think? I, I feel very safe back here. Jerry's sense of humor is disturbing, but the general consensus in the defense industry is that robots like Jerry's do some of the dangerous work that normally soldiers would have to do themselves. I would love to see it go into the military. I mean, I have a 24-year-old son. You know, if he were in there, that's the gun I'd want in his hands. What, what do you want your weapons to do? You really want to know what I'm going to do? I think that they will create a problem that's so bad for terrorist groups that they can't fight against them. How do you fight against a machine that doesn't have to eat, doesn't have to sleep, not afraid of anything, and so little you can't see it? But to date, Jerry has yet to gain the interest of the U.S. military, which favors buying robots from big defense contractors over small entrepreneurs. We would like for the U.S. military to have them. Depends on whether they want them or not. It seems like all they want to do is stay with the same old, same old all the time, and I and build big, huge systems to fight a war we don't have. There's nothing being done to fight the one we got, I'll tell you that. Even though at 74, Jerry's in the twilight of his gun-making career, he's on to something with the gun-robot combo. The Army's also on that same path and quickly coming up with their own robotics suited for today's wars. But until Jerry's AA-12 makes it to the U.S. military, he will continue to play, tweak, and perfect his lethal robot. Uh, stay here so I can mark you off to make sure that we have accountability for you. Larson? Aye. My journey around America looking for the next wave of robotic technology takes me to White Sands Missile Range, a huge military installation where the Army's testing a series of robots that they're trying to get into the fight. This place is interesting. This is actually where they tested the first uh, atomic weapon, the Trinity test. So for decades, they've used this as a facility to test new technology. 
The atomic bomb might be the most powerful weapon ever invented, but today we're fighting insurgencies, which don't require the heavy weaponry of the past. Instead, they require systems like robots and networks. Today, I'm here to see a field test of robot prototypes made for the army that takes place in a mock Iraqi village. I didn't know quite what to expect, but ended up having ringside seats to a simulated assault. So what you're seeing here is the beginning of the assault on the target, and you can see guys in the bushes all behind me here moving from the vehicles onto the target. As the troops moved in, the simulated enemy opened fire, and so now there's this, this firefight going on behind me. That's conventional war. But what's different is the loud buzzing noise above the battlefield. It's an unmanned aerial vehicle, basically an eye in the sky, or as the troops like to call it, the flying half K. And it's one of the robots that's under review today. I think the principle here is that the, the eye in the sky can see things uh, that the soldier hiding behind a bush worrying about getting shot at can't see. If you can show a guy a picture of what's happening beyond the next hill, he doesn't have to send a soldier to report back to him. As soon as you send a soldier, he's at risk. If you can send a robot, then you transfer some risk from soldiers to robots. If you can see this guy behind me, he's actually controlling the UAV. He's got a laptop computer. You can also tell he's got the little antenna on the back of his backpack there. Successful landing, I guess. Eric Salt, brother. <laughs> Just let me, let me, as your military liaison, translate for you. When they say hua, it means they did something good. Today's test is taking place in front of the media, congressional delegates, and the developers of the technology, like Boeing. This is the gimbal sensor here. So those are the three factors we're looking Was for. About this? Is that... The demonstration's half test and half dog and pony show. There's a lot of money on the line. The budget for the development of these bots and the networks that link them together is almost $2 billion. So to get the straight scoop on whether or not this stuff actually works, I talked to one of the soldiers operating the equipment. It's the Hawk, right? This is the yeah, Hawk, This is right? the T-Hawk. What's been your experience with it so far? Do you like this thing? You think it's um, useful? It's a good vehicle. It should probably be built a little bit more rugged for the army, though. It's useful depending on what mission you're doing. But then if you have to do maintenance on it, stuff like that, it kind of becomes a hassle. It can be done, and it's good, but it, it just becomes a hassle. Next up for review, a little remote control ground robot called the SUG-V that looks like Wally. Come check this out. Like You can see how he's operating it with just like a little PlayStation controller. The idea of that thing is it can like shimmy around a building or go up some stairs and it can take a look. It's got a bunch of cameras on it. It can take a look at something without the soldier having to get into the, the line of fire. You guys tell me about the Sugby. I mean, it's so cute. You use this thing to pick up chicks in, in the desert? Is that what you... I mean, we're using it right now to find chicks in the desert. So far, <laughs> no good. But I mean, we use it for, we've had other practical uses for it, like looking up bombs and things. I guess that's next to looking up girls. As a veteran and everything, I was in Baghdad. I could have really used this going into houses instead of just the whole pray and go through a corner route. Do you want to drive it around for a minute? Sure. I got it! Don't be nervous! Okay, I'm gonna try something out here. Let's see. All right, I'm gonna stop here. Come on, little guy, do your thing. On my eye cam right here on this monocle, I can basically see the entire undercarriage of the vehicle, which is pretty cool. Like, I can see that. I can see that being useful. The SUG-V's controller looks just like an Xbox controller. So for a lot of soldiers, it's a piece of cake to pick up. When we started developing the controllers for these, vi these vehicles, we said, well, what, what do we want? We want a joystick. And some soldier in the AETF said, hey, you know what you ought to give me? You ought to give me an Xbox controller, because I know how to use that. I used to play a lot of video games. <laughs> this type thing right here, I, I don't even have to look at the controller to see what I'm doing half the time. These robots might resemble high school science fair projects, but the SUGVs and the UAVs represent a new breed of tools that our current wars call for. Tools that are meant to help find individual targets while taking the soldier out of harm's way. Our Army is, is constantly looking for ways to save a soldier's lives, first of all. And uh, one of the keys to that is seeing the other guy first and being able to react and decide uh, 
prior to or faster than the enemy can. What I saw today is a response to eight years of fighting insurgencies. But even in the best case scenario, these prototypes won't be deployed until 2011 when they're distributed to seven brigade combat teams headed for Afghanistan. On any given morning in Afghanistan, competing with the tranquil hum of the morning call to prayer, you might hear a loud buzzing sound from above. That's because 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there's an average of 36 unmanned and heavily armed aerial assassins roaming the skies to seek and destroy high value targets. What do you call this apex hunter? The Predator. The Predator is the ultimate manifestation of remote control warfare. It's small, it's lightweight, and it's lethal. Only 1,200 pounds empty, it can be armed with two Hellfire missiles. The Predators flying over Afghanistan can be operated from as far away as Nevada. Operators fly lethal Predator missions by day and head home to their families at night. It's a tactician's dream, safe for the operator and deadly to the enemy. For the last 50 years, weapons have been designed to blow up buildings, boats, barracks. But with the Predator, we've come up with a weapon that can target an individual. That's a major sea change. But what's also changed is the soldier. These technologies still need operators, and the new generation of soldiers has to be fluent in the language of tech. So the Army built a mecha to recruit the gamer GI and the future remote control warriors. It's called the Army Experience Center, and it's in a mall outside of Philly. This $13 million Army Arcade is recruiting 2.0, and it's a gamer's paradise. This is pretty sweet, and it's just here for your use, yeah. and it's awesome. It's a great experience. What makes you come? Uh, well, I'm thinking about joining the Army and seriously considering it, and uh, I'm a senior in high school right now. So I just I talked to my recruiter, and he said to come here and try all this stuff out, and I came and I just tried out the Blackhawk Simulator. The life-size simulators are the main attraction at this arcade, and I had to give them a go. You can feel the wind. They simulate the wind as if you're actually flying in a chopper. I'm in boy army heaven. But this isn't just a playground. I'm Janae Nelson, and I am a 25 Bravo, which is computers communications. Janae doesn't fit the profile for your typical recruit. But because of the emphasis on tech at the Army Experience Center, there's now an incentive for self-proclaimed geeks like Janae to join the Army. What attracted you to the Army and to the Army technology? Um, well, first I'm really into computers, and there's a million job opportunities, and you can get some amazing training here. What kind of stuff do you think you're going to do when you're in the Nelson? Um, probably a lot of debugging and decoding and just fixing some fried computers. Are you scared at all? No, I should I be? It's not surprising she's not scared. In the army that Janae is stepping into, it's quickly becoming a reality that she could go to war without really going to war. The robotic technology being developed today will go a long way towards keeping soldiers like Janae off the conventional battlefield. But they also come with serious drawbacks. The Predator, for one, has been responsible for killing civilians along with enemy targets. We tend to think that with these unmanned weapons that we're making warfare easy and clean and neat. Um, uh, and therefore we can do more of it. Um, I have lots of problems with that. I can't imagine um, a world where this becomes the normal form of warfare. But as I learned on my journey, robots are quickly becoming the norm. In the last five years, we've gone from 300 to 7,000 UAVs in action, with more on the way. The Army's ramping up to deploy those robots under review, and Jerry is still trying to get his bots into the battle. After 100 years of using bigger hardware to attack bigger targets, we've reversed the trend. Both the technology and the targets are going small again. In some ways, it is what it was in the beginning, just cavemen throwing rocks at each other. Difference is, nowadays, those rocks have microchips, and the cavemen, 
actually get to use that opposable thumb. Vanguard Wednesdays at 10 p.m. on Current or online at current.com slash Vanguard.